had spoken bravely of uh, Faulkner, and you thought maybe it could be a link between what we said this morning and how we start. And before we went for lunch, I said maybe it's it's also nice to remember how um, how much humiliation and suffering uh, William Faulkner got in um, when he was hired in the studio. And I don't mean that in a sense, you know, real artists are not made for compromise. Faulkner was a I guess, I never met him, but I guess reading him that he was also very matter of fact for certain things. He had a farm, he was not rich, he had a big family. So when he was accepting to go to Hollywood, because his books, he was famous and, and respected, but he, he didn't sell a lot. So when he accepted to go to Hollywood, it was also, of course, not also, first of all for the money. And, but there he was treated, if I understood well, uh, not as a um, grand writer, he was treated as a student in script writing, you know, he was really, he, he had to learn, you know. And I think it was a sort of desperate uh, attempt. Huh? For two reasons, maybe because he didn't understand the way people wanted him to tell a story. And I think this was honest. And also because he was unhappy, he was drinking a lot. But for instance, if you heard about that, film uh, adapted from one of his novels called Pylon. You know Pylon? No. Um, can you look on a... Pylon? Pylon, like a... Like, it's a famous Faulkner book, but it's also a film adapted by Douglas no, have you heard of it? I know Douglas Sirk's work. It's a German director who was exiled. The, tri the Triangle Angels? Ah, maybe. Yeah, be. maybe it's, it's, that's the name of the film. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's adapted from Pylon. Yeah, it says Pylon and yeah. Ah, okay. So it, it's really a very, um, very, I, I would say it's, it's a very honest adaptation. Probably rearranged to be a Hollywood movie, but it was not a very, Douglas Sirk was a, not, he was like a second class director, never, huh? I mean, doesn't mean he was a, he's a great director, but I mean in terms of budget in, in the studio. And so this is interesting because in the film, um, the, the film erased a sort of uh, typical of William Faulkner, that is, in William Faulkner's stories, um, maybe not all the characters, but, but the important character or characters are doomed. There is no way to escape to that. So for instance, in bio, it's about uh, after the First World War, 
and before, just before the Second World War, veterans from the First World War who were pilots are doing a stunt with their old plane for little money. And they do extremely brave figure. And their plane are old and not well kept because they're not rich enough. So of course there is a death in the end. But the story in the book is told by a newspaper guy who, who is um, drinking a lot. It, it takes place in New Orleans. And he's, he's, he's told to cover the, the aviation day, you know? And he actually fell in love with a trio of those two pilots and, and a woman and a child. And in fact, at the beginning, apparently, one, there is the, the, the woman, her husband, and a son. And, but the, it's um, also a couple of men. So all this is erased in the film. It's, and the journalist in the book is the man character. He's telling the story. He's drinking. And he's following them like their shadow because he understood not only they are beautiful and brave, but also they are doomed. He understand everything and he understand that it's this is going to end very badly. Maybe not the day, maybe not the day after, but if it's not this time, it will be another time. So is shadowing them, trying to get interviews, trying to cover the story, but as if it was the most important thing in his life, as if he was in fact trying to save them, you know, in a way, much more than making a paper for the newspaper. And, and the, the novel is written in the rhythm of um, the punctuation, it, at the end, he's so drunk, he cannot walk straight, and, and it's as if the writing was also uh, uh, breathing hard, you know, like something was... So, of course, the story in the film was more elaborated for Hollywood. The, the strange couple, no more, things like that, you know, I mean, and the journalist is, is not the main character. In fact, it's a story of two brave veterans and this woman, and their braveness, you know. It's not a story of what happened to people who were young and beautiful, went to the war, were brave pilot, and they are so poor, the only thing they can do to eat is to do crazy stunt, you know, and not to be respected, you know. So it's more about the soldier they were, the pilot they were, and what they are, and, and the journalist lead you to, to this extremely sad story, you know, the, of... And of course, uh, it's called Pylon because one of the fi major figures is to um, fly between two pylons, you know? I mean, they're doing stunts all the time. So I think this... I would not think um, it's a bad thing to not to have kept the main character like in the book 
and the film is beautiful, but it is um, like a two-dimensional story, you know, like something bad is going to happen, of course, they do crazy things, in the night, they, 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 they change little piece of the, in the plane, you know, I mean, of course, you understand in the film, Tarnish Angel, it said, huh? okay. But the relation with the journalist is because maybe it, it would have been very difficult to have the same relation in a film. But it's as if someone was himself so miserable that he could see the tarnished glory of those people, their beauty, and knowing that there was nothing in the country or in their surrounding to help them, that they were condemned to be stunned and probably to die by accident or to be wounded. So he's trying to reverse the, the, the curse, you know? But he's, as, he's even weaker than they are, you know? So he cannot do it. But this desperate movement creates something. Creates something of um, maybe more modern than the film is actually. Like maybe uh, Vertigo by Alfred Hitchcock, where a cop is trying to solve, but he's losing himself all together, you know? So I think Faulkner invented this sort of anti-heroic figure of the, ma the main character who is, um, instead of being leading the narration, is going to be lost into the narration, like in Vertigo. Huh? He's completely... Uh, I mean, um, I don't understand the word. I don't know the. I, I forgot the word in English. But he, he, he thinks he, he he's following the right person, but he's a he's a puppet in the end of the story, you know. So, uh, in a sense, why did I start by saying that Faulkner was important? Not for the script he never wrote, but for the... He, he wrote three, actually, you could find them. They, they, they were published, three or four. What is interesting is because it's a, a statement as, as a writer and probably as a human being is that uh, something is, is fucked up right at the beginning let's say doomed, it's, it's more a Faulknerian word, is very, um, let's say, uh, very often, he will say something at the beginning of a novel, short or long, that is revealing the end. Maybe not totally, but in a way, there is a novel here called The Hamlet. It's a short novel, rather famous. It's about a, a fa one man and his family. Um, they arrive very poor in a small town, in the south, of course, and little by little, they buy and they buy the field, the farm, the shop. Even one of the family become the school teacher. You know, they, uh, take possession of the complete place, but they enter the story like one poor beggar begging for a mule, you know? They enter in the story like the, the, the first snow, enter the story like the weakest little insect, you know? Everybody is uh, laughing 
but you will gain everything, you know. Suddenly all his brother, sister, cousin, I mean everything is snobs in the end. But it is already said in the beginning, not, uh, not like in a country song, this is the story of how the snob family take over. No, so something says that uh, this weak little thing uh, that everyone is laughing at is going to knock everyone off, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's in, not in a funny way, it's in a way that um, the way it was before snobs arrive is not so good. It's maybe slightly rotten already. That's why it makes it easy for snow to grab it. But it, it's getting worse because it was slightly rotten. So by the time the snow family gets old, nothing is left. It, it's like termite, you know? Nothing is left behind. And I think it has this type of narration when you already raise the curtain at the beginning to let you know, not to start by the end and to go backward, no. To raise the curtain to say, in this story, the end will be that, you know, and then so let's say you know more or less what is the end, doesn't mean you have absolutely no pleasure as a reader or as an audience to um, find out how it, it happened, all the details of the, the... The narration can be still surprising even if you know it's doomed right at the beginning, you know? And I think this is important to know because it doesn't mean a film, the narration for a film is really creating a lot of suspense by revealing little by little to keep the big secret for the end. Mm -hmm. Often the suspense is, is a also very interesting when you know a little bit too much at the beginning. So you are even more surprised to discover what you have guessed, how it will happen, you know? And I think that's uh, a lot coming from a writer like Faulkner and also maybe like um, it's something Dashiell Hammett used a lot also mm -hmm. to say in the first three lines, this is the f story of a family, the Dane, and the, film, the, the story is called The Dane Curse. So, you know, and I remember, I don't know, in, in one um, novel written by Dashiell Hammett, the, it's always the character, it's always the detective, um, it's a um, noir novel. Huh? So the detective is sent to, I think it's always called Bay City or something like that. No, it, it, it has a name, the, the, the city. It, it's, it's supposed to be, I guess, Los Angeles and San Francisco. It's a place where rich people, mm. let's say money equal corruption. Huh? This is more or less. So the first line is driving his car, entering the city, and there is the name of the city, let's say Sin City, <laughs> it's not that. And he, the, the first thing he sees, it's two cops at the crossroad. And he described the cops, say, slightly overweight, not well shaved, 
and one of them is smoking. And the detective thinks to himself, when you see two cops, one is not well shaved and the other is smoking on duty, you know the job is going to be tough. <laughs> because a city with cops like that, not an easy place. So this kind of thing, it's, it is a writer, but it's, it's something you can, it's very interesting in films. And I think that what, that's why they, uh, in, they inspire so much cinema noir and, and uh, even not only cinema noir, but to give something at the beginning that is already a part of the ending, a part of, of what, so it creates a sort of um, bigger expectation. Because if you enter a place, a city, and you have two cops, no description and it's going on, okay, it's a detective who is going for his job to, to find who is the lover of Mrs. Wu, I don't know what, I forgot the story a little bit. Already you know it's the third line of the novel and you know the cops are not well shaved, they're smoking on duty. Wow. Yeah. But it, it's visual details, mm -hmm. you know. It, it's that intellectual, psychological, you know, in the mind of the cops who have not shaved in the morning. Maybe his wife uh, was sick, you know, you don't, no, it's not psychological, it's not through dialogues, it's not through a voiceover, it's, it's, a, it's a, vi a visualization of a spot, a, a place, a city, and already you feel something is going wrong there, you know. So even though it's the opening of the story, you don't know what's going to happen, you have a hint of something that instead of um, let's say you might be said, oh, if you want to create suspense, save this for that. No, maybe sometimes if you give it too much mm -hmm. up front, you, you create a, a a much more um, interesting uh, narration. I, I read uh, an article about Dash Element. You know who is Dash Element? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah? A French writer said, I, I always wanted to imitate him, but it was so refined, such a small detail, mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. So one of my novels, I start. Um, it was a, a, a strange day for me. Uh, my mother-in-law went for lunch and my wife lost something. And at the end of lunch, my son, uh, took a gun and shoot himself in front of us, you know. So, imagine now what is the story after that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to prove that it could, there could be, it could be an op a possible opening, not closing a story, but opening the story differently, uh, like by ending, by, by um, closing moment, you know. Of course, as a father, if your son shoot himself in front of you, probably you feel you were not such a great father, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. Whatever. I have not read the novel, but I, I, I was laughing because he was mentioning that she you know, it. It's often that 
loss of the marriage after that, if the wife had lost something as a metaphor for what he was going to lose after the son dies. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Important. That's why, no, we were uh, trying to speak about the narration in a way, for instance, in, it is great means. Yeah. Are you going to cook that? No, I'm just going to Ah, well, okay, no, 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 she's okay. So th there is a, I think the title changed now because the title, when it was published, was uh, the White Palms, but I think it was not the title Faulkner gave, and now it's published again under another title. Yeah, so White Palms is mainly not Faulkner. The internet's down, but when the internet comes back up, I'll let you know. Ah, okay. Anyway. The, it's very strange when you read it first time, not knowing nothing, because in fact it developed and it could very well be a script. Mm -hmm. Although at that time probably Hollywood would have refused. He starts two stories parallel. You would imagine that his purpose is to have at one point the two stories to meet. Mm -hmm. But the two stories are never going to meet. Because very logically, although it takes place around New Orleans, the, as a matter of fact, the people who are the heroes of those two narrations have nothing to do, to meet, have no reason to meet. One is in New Orleans at a party, um, the description of a, a couple, a, a very beautiful woman, and she has children, and husband and she looks happy, pretty, everything. And at the party, she meets this other guy introduced to her by her husband with a, a doctor. And he's he, a new doctor, he, he's going to settle in New Orleans, but he knew nobody. And immediately you understand, thanks to Faulkner's style, that they are going to fall in love, but in a way that will destroy them because it's so much. And so their falling in love is so that they must run away from New Orleans because she's married and, and she's losing her kids. There is no possible divorce at that time. And in that society, high bourgeoisie in, in New Orleans, so if she goes, she goes alone, not with her kids, you know. And they go like thief, you know. They mm -hmm. run away like thief. And this story is like all the way through they run away. And because he's a doctor, and it's not a kind of job you can do in a nomad life, they have no money. So after she sells a few jewels, He's even working in a, in a mine, I think, you know. The, the, but for some reason, even though sometimes he's telling her, go back to your family, you, you, you're dying next to me, she, they are the, really that's the word too, you know, they are, they are together in a way that she knows they both know it, it, it's going to end bad, but it's there. Um, they can't escape to that love, whatever the cost is. Until 
she's pregnant. And, and the end is by the sea. And she, the pregnancy is reaching the end, but it's, she's very weak and it's, she starts bleeding, it's not good, and she can hear the, this sound of the white pipes in the wind because there is a sort of tempest. Mm -hmm. And he is a doctor, but he, he cannot save her because he's so afraid of doing wrong. He, he wants to call another doctor to make sure he is not going to. So, I don't, this is almost the end. I mean, of course, it's not a funny ending. As you can. The other story is a, pen, a penitentiary. And there is the, um, after, a, like every year, but this time it's a big, big uh, uh, rain season. The, the Mississippi is uh, overflowing like always, but much more than usually. And the penitentiary is completely um, um, flooded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, guard and uh, prisoners, uh, I, as a, some prisoner died, uh, uh, drowned, but some prisoner is, could escape, you know, and by the next morning, um, uh, one of the prisoner is found swimming by two guards, and he's very strong, and he's, he's accused of murder. He has to serve prison for life. And he's maybe the guy taking a little bit like a simple, you know? Mm. He's a murderer, but also he's a simple guy. So they, they ask him to row for them because he's a very strong guy. After a while, I passed the detail. This guy, he did nothing wrong, but he's all alone, the guard. For some, but he stayed on his own in the boat, rowing, and he heard a scream. Not because he killed the guard, huh? he is totally innocent. Uh, and he sees a woman uh, with a child on a roof of a hut or something asking for help, so we take her and they row and they row. They, they are in the bayous, it's endless, you know, and he is fishing for her and the child. He, she's crying, she has lost everything, her husband, so he's taking good care of her. And, and at the end, they went to the bayou where the, some Indian and um, the people who live in the bayou, ex-French, um, how she too, sort of Creole, Cajun, Cajun people, they, they accept them and, and he could start a new life and the woman is in love with him and the kid likes him. It's a sort of paradise in this place, like he's no more this guy escaped from jail. Um, everything and in the, in the small village they give him a name, you know, so he, he has nothing to worry about. And he is happy, is, and he is happy also, he feels she is happy. 
and she wants to have a baby with him. And then one day a police officer not drive by because it's in the bayou or row by mm. and uh, he ran to him and gave his real name and said please take me back to the penitentiary um, I, I should not be there I've been uh, taken away by the flood and I didn't know the way to return you have to take me and bring me back and the cop is almost surprised because the flood was like two or three months ago, you know? So, or maybe six months, I forgot. So it's as if he couldn't stand this new possible life. He, he was, he had been getting ready for the other life. He could not accept this new, this opportunity. So, it's two stories, they, they get along in parallel, and of course there is no meeting, never. But he, when, he, uh, when, he, when it's published, you have one chapter is the story of the couple, and the next chapter is the story of the convict, you know? And, and again, the couple, Again, the convict, you know, like that. At the very beginning, it's a little bit surprising because you expect really uh, that they will converge, you know, mm -hmm. but they never. So, both stories are great. Both are pal palpitant, palpitating, yeah, really. But it's a little bit difficult to adapt oneself to reading one story and stop. Of course, at a moment where you don't want to stop and then go to the other story and stop, you know. And it's so brilliant because when you finish the novel, you realize the two stories uh, nourish each other. I mean, as if the, the natural love um, uh, growing on the boat between the convict and this woman and the desperate love of the couple of New Orleans that, that nourish each, each story, you know? So it was I don't know what is the truth. It was said that he had two novels, no one wanted to publish, mm -hmm. and, and, and he made this whatever, I don't know. But I think it's so um, fantastic after you read it to discover that the, the mind, and you might think, it's a book, but you might also you, you can also realize that if it was, it it could be possible to to think of a narration like that in a film, you know. Mm -hmm. Especially knowing that you're not going to make happen the meeting point, to leave it open because it, it's their destiny. I think it will be. Um, very interesting. I, I think, of course, it has influenced many f film directors, mm -hmm. for sure, many other writers. But I think this is, for me, um, a man who, who more than uh, Balzac, the French writer, for instance, who is really inventing so much fiction it's it's like a, a treasure you take you take you can but it's always it's a tale you know mm -hmm. with Faulkner you have you are everywhere in the story 
you can be the victim, you can be the police officer, you are you have the many point of views possible and therefore it's it's more cinematic for me and more inspiring in a way. There uh, there's a movie called Mr. Lonely. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you know it? That's by Harvey mm -hmm. Cohen? Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, where, I mean, when I saw it at the end, I was very frustrated by the fact that the storyline of the commune outside of Paris and the storyline of the, of the convent, wherever, the fact that they didn't actually end up coming together. But what I, what I realize now, just right now, is that it's not about the two stories coming together, but recognizing that pockets of people will do anything to feel the ecstatic, to just like blow open life and, and experience this kind of um, this kind of divinity and dignity through whatever means possible. Um, and now I kind of love the movie. <laughs> no, no, and I think uh, Armani Corinne is 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 um, also a poet, and he knows mm -hmm. very well the power of construction in writing a narration, mm -hmm. and is not afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the purpose is to frustrate the audience. I think the purpose, what is interesting, is to propose, mm -hmm. offer um, a sort of angle, a slightly different what mm -hmm. expected, mm -hmm. um, maybe to offer the audience something a little bit more difficult to express mm -hmm. and maybe a sort of void between two stories that has nothing to do, mm -hmm. create a sort of void that could contain something that the audience could f fulfill mm -hmm. and represent them in, 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 in itself, mm -hmm. in, in oneself, mm -hmm. I think, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there are there are also there are also parallels that I didn't see at the time, which is you know why why people join convents. Certainly because of religious dedication, but also I wouldn't I wouldn't put it I wouldn't say that it that has nothing to do with loneliness. You know that that some that many. Uh, religious devotees have felt lonely and, and needed to confine themselves in a community where their, um, their experiences were more accepted. Because who's to say that their religious experience is a lie? It just happens to be not what most people experience in their lifetime. Yeah. Um, and also just the need to be outstanding, you know, both these people that impersonated celebrities wanted to feel outstanding, and these other this other group that needed to be outstanding through um, a relationship to an Almighty. It was really actually. I mean, I thought it was really. I loved uh, Averna Herzog's performance. You know, me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sisters, sisters. He was like, wait till I get the single. So emphatic. Um, but it confused, you know, it did give me some confusion at the end. I'm like, so those, those two stories don't go together, but they do. Yeah. It was great. I thought it was beautiful. And, and maybe before we change a subject, I wanted to say that speaking of Tashi Lamet or William Faulkner or Douglas Sirk or Harmony Corinne may seem we are speaking of narration that. Um, a sort of pathetically reflect the soul of people. But it's also very interesting in comedy. It's also very, very interesting in comedy. 
like the beginning, we were mentioning yesterday, the beginning of the Big Panther, you know? Mm -hmm. you, you don't know which track to follow, you know, Unt mm -hmm. until you know. But I mean, uh, there is always, I think, um, to invent your own rule to narrate uh, a story, a film, a script. Oh, thank you. You have a problem. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, this time. You want a little bonbon? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, it's also very interesting in, in for comedies. It's not meant to be sad, you know? No. Mm -hmm. No, no, not at all. I think it. Um, it's always great to be surprised also uh, in a comedy. Mm -hmm. Like, for mm -hmm. instance, Wes Anderson comedy, or, mm -hmm. you know, the way he invents uh, how to tell a story sometimes, it, it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. 